All right, hello everybody. I'm Brendan Patrick here with Tyler Horsepool for a Prism Deck Tech. Prism, quite a pick for the Pro Tour, eh? Um, There's one that I know I talked to, I talked to a lot of trash about, and of course, I ate my words. I joked with Tyler at the end of the Pro Tour that, um, you know, I'm giving him all that good luck by by talking bad about his hero every time he goes and just dominates with it. Um, quickly, Tyler, how did you feel post post Pro Tour about the deck? Do you think you made the right choice? Um, and if you could go back and pick a hero again, would you choose Prism? I would, especially if you give me the trash talk again. I'll take that that boost every time. Um, but I, I mean, you, when we did we did a Twitter space together, and I wasn't comfortable with Pri like saying Prism was a good deck actually uh, when the format first was revealed to us with the ban and restricted. Uh, but after the Pro Tour, I feel fantastic about Prism, and I would have taken the deck again. Uh, I do feel very, like, I feel very unlucky. Like, I felt like I was on the wrong side of variance and was still able to go with, uh, I think I had a 9-5 and five record. And I felt like in all five losses that I had, like, crazy stories to tell. So I, I would go with it again. Mm -hmm. What do you, th what's the strength of Prism in this meadow? Like... Uh, let's say I'm picking this deck up to play it in a pro quest. Um, what kind of advantages do I have over the other popular decks? Things like Chain, Starvo. Um, I think Kano is probably going to be an easier matchup for you, but I guess Lexi would be considered there as well. Yeah, so you pick up Prism not because you're doing the most busted thing in the format. That is not, not why you take this deck. You take this deck as what I call like an anti-meta choice. And so... In order to make Prism a good deck, you need to have good matchups across what you expect to be the bulk meta. And going into the Pro Tour, I thought Starvo and Chain were going to make up 50% plus of the meta. And so what I did was I took my Vegas list that I won the calling with and basically tried to tune it to this particular meta. And so you'll see cards like Sigil of Solace and Impenetrable Belief make their way back into the deck. And that makes the Chain matchup against bad players very good. Against good players, like um, you still have somewhat of an advantage because, especially with the Polish players bringing aggro prism, um, they don't know what you're on, so they kind of have to hedge, and that gives you a couple of percentage points. I want to say this is like a slightly favorable matchup against like really good chain players, um, and if they are boarding like sixty cards on you, you might as well be a buy. So you're 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 ranging from like fifty percent is the worst to like ultra favorable in the chain matchup, depending on who you're playing against and what they're attacking for. And then against Starvo, you're just holding your, you know, 60%, I'm going to win against Starvo, and then if they fuse every time, I'm going to lose kind of matchup. And so if I had slightly favorable matchups into both decks, I felt like that was a good place to be when you can predict about what 60% of the meta is. Now, when Kano gets thrown in there, when people are playing Ice Lexi, these are ultra-favorable matchups, and now the meta game becomes like, you know, this the world's my oyster. Mm -hmm. So this this was this is a good uh, deck into the current meta, for sure. For sure. So talk to me a little bit about how the deck works, right? Um, so last meta, or at least before the banish, we saw a lot of aura prism. Um, you know, there are a lot of auras in this deck. Particularly, you do have a lot of the light auras in, um, as well as of course the blue ones. Are you still focused on trying to you know land two auras a turn um, in most matchups that are not chain, get the advantage and sort of pull away from there, or does this herald package and somewhat this defensive package all pl also play a large part? So um, this is an aura deck for sure. The when I built this deck, uh, it was actually not playing even miraging metamorph, mm. and the idea was I wanted to take out as much of the red cards as I could to make blue and yellow. The idea being that the yellow auras cost four or six. And um, if your main plan is to play two auras a turn, you need your other two cards to at least add up to four resources. And so you either want to draw double yellow or blue red at the very worst. And um, if you draw a red card, your odds go very far down that you're going to double aura that turn. Now, the reason that I brought Miraging Metamorph back is just the card's too good. Mm -hmm. um, and it also fits into what you want to do as an aura. It catches you up by like it's it's just a fireball for seven. No one wants to block this card. If they are, they're either taking two or three cards, or you know they definitely don't want to pop it. So 
Um, the idea here is still very much double aura, but you actually have like a multifaceted plan. So there's three main, main plans that I'm um, going for here. One is fatiguing chain. Mm -hmm. So that's like one package. You can see that we have red sigil, red sink belows. Um, anything that blocks for three, blue impenetrably, things like this come in. And then um, I, you have a plan versus aggressive decks. This is your Briar, uh, Katsu, um, these kind of decks, which actually you generally have bad matchups into. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is when you're bringing, you know, this is when you're bringing in just like the lowest amount of res that you can, and you're playing very, very hard into the aura package because even if you're unfavored, this can beat anybody. Mm -hmm. And if you watch my round two matchup against that poor Briar player, it didn't it didn't go well for them. It ended 34-0. So you definitely can still win that matchup, especially if you practice it. And then your third package is the Starvo package. This is the unmovable, the prismatic shield. Um, and then you also have, I guess you have a fourth one when you're playing the prism mirror because you that's that's a nutshell on all of itself. So you have four side plan, sideboard plans here, uh, just working, kind of shifting all around. And then you have like main like 49 cards that you're playing in every matchup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to, uh, playing, I played a bit of prism in the last minute. So I just want to kind of point out some cards that are somewhat unique in this deck. Obviously we, there are, uh, the obvious ones in the, in the, you know, the sigil of solace, potentially the sink belows and the appendage of Belize. but let's talk about the yellow herald of ravages. So no herald of uh, triumph in this deck and you've opted for the yellow herald of ravages. Can you just run me through sort of the thought, uh, behind that? Yeah, so uh, a friend of mine, Adam Fiffles, and I um, actually talked this through, and we were deciding what are the best of the like bottom five heralds, I guess, because you're going to play Erudition, you're going to play War Tunes, um, you're going to play Protection. That goes into every Prism list. I think everyone agrees that those are the three best yellow heralds that you can put in here, and you need to complete your yellow count, So, and then Celestial Cataclysm is going to take up a slot. So... Basically, Judgment and Ravages were the two that I selected. But I think we kind of agreed that, depending on the meta, you could pick any of four. Tenacity being the only one that you're never going to pick, um, unless something crazy happens. Uh, but I went with Ravages because I wanted more percentage points into the racing matchups. And her uh, Ravages can do the extra damage, where the, yellow the other yellow ones cannot. Mm -hmm. And especially when you have Ode out, now you're doing, um, it's doing double duty. Um, so my plan here was to have something that was good with the ore package and something that was, um, going to do that extra point of damage that might get me a win that I otherwise wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to fatiguing chain, because I know that a lot of people actually didn't bring prism for <laughs> the sole reason being, um, expecting a lot of chain to be at that tournament, or at least even in the pro quest season that we're still experiencing is, you know, We've obviously you're boarding out sort of the the zero blocks where you can. You're adding in the blocking cards. You have the defense reactions, the sigils. But do you have any tips um, just for that matchup in general? Is it as simple as I just put down my my four card hand every turn, or is there like larger strategy and game plans that go into actually being able to fatigue that deck? Yeah. So there's a lot of little tips and tricks, and I could I could talk ten minutes just about the little tips and tricks. So. Um, the first one being that blocking efficiency is your best friend. It's not something that's talked a lot about in you know articles and on things, but um, blocking, you know, putting a three block on a two block is obviously not good value. Um, you you would rather try to block with two ones or a two if you could. So that's going to be like if you can focus on that, that's going to be number one and the most helpful tool. The second thing is that um, you have one thing that helps you fatigue in this that the other decks don't have, and that's Arclight Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And so you actually don't win every time from getting through all their cards. I won about half my matchups against Chain by stacking their Blood Debt. And um, so if you can get a pivotal ALS on turn three or four or whatever, and they they ha they already have like three or four Blood Debt cards that they like been saving for their uh, you know pivotal turns. Well, that's going to now work against them. Um, because now they're going to end up with like seven for that turn, and then whatever they get next turn, and they're not going to be able to get all of them out. All of a sudden, their husk is gone. Um, so actually, some matchups you can win just by them damaging themselves. And then, um, let's see, what else? Uh, putting a one-drop into your arsenal, either Wartoon Herald or Miraging Metamorph on turns four, five, or six is going to be super pivotal, 
because then you can use Tunic plus either that Miraging Metamorph or that Warchin, Yellow Warchin Herald to kill their Urser, and their Urser is going to be what they're relying on for the mm -hmm. late game to get those last couple points of damage. Um, outside of that, uh, use Footsteps as liberally as you can, although I would say if they're presenting a 5 attack against you um, and they have cards in hand, I would venture against it. Um, the reason being that if they present an Art of War, that they're going to break your footsteps, and you're going to need those footsteps as long as possible. So any four, four attacker down, uh, especially when they're starting with it, it's like you could have red sink below and a three block plus footsteps. I would almost always go with the three block plus footsteps and keep the four block because I'm going to keep using the footsteps over and over again, probably because they're breaking the chain. Now, good chains will minimize that, but you're still going to break the chain at least probably once a turn. Mm -hmm. And so that one resource just netted you a two block almost every turn, which is which is part of the reason that you want to play Prism Fatigue. So those are just a couple of the tips. As I said, I could go on and on about like how you could attack at the beginning mm -hmm. um, and when it's right to attack and when it's not. Because, I mean, these it, it's just something that you have to play over and over and over again to really get... Uh, handle on so there is a balance between defending and because I, I can see a lot of players picking up this deck they're going and they're planning to fatigue chain right like that's going to be their main game plan but then you know they draw that hand right that hand that does the the 20 plus damage or it's got the disruption in it as well and they're like you know what maybe i can take 15 here just to deal some back do you find that to be often the incorrect decision or contextually in some situation, is it right to present a lot of damage to the chain player and take some damage um, as a cost to do that? Yeah, 99, 90 to 95% of the time, it's a trap. Mm -hmm. um, especially if they have Husk up. It's like almost never the right decision to attack unless you can see for sure this going well for you. And, and those cases are usually you're already winning the game just by blocking anyway. So I would say... If you're like a beginner player trying to pick up this, which, uh, good luck. It's it's one of the more difficult things that you can do in Flesh and Blood. But um, I I would say that uh, try to try to refrain from attacking as much as possible unless the you are purposely left with like extra cards in hand after blocking. Um, for example, I know a lot of people are trying to move to Aether Iron Weave, and mm -hmm. so in those cases where like okay, I blocked with three cards and then they stopped attacking me or they attacked my my parable or whatever to get it off the board and I got left with like a yellow plus a judgment in arsenal. Um, I might throw it out then because something that isn't talked about a lot with Shane is that you're trying to get through cards. You're not trying you're you're not trying to fatigue them for like 30 turns just because you're trying to get through all their cards and that's why fatiguing chain is so profitable. So if you're throwing out a yellow herald of judgment and they're blocking it with two cards, that's two less cards that you have to defend. So um, you might think, oh, like, why don't you just attack, you know, all the time? Well, then then you're taking the damage and then you're you're losing the race. So you want to take as little damage as possible and only attack with the cards that are left to you, usually after an ALS turn or after a subpar turn from the mm -hmm. chain. And do you feel comfortable into Starva with this list? Because um, while this does, this is a similar package to what we've seen, there are a few pieces that have been that have been taken out, right? Where we don't have the Arcanite Skull Cap. I know that there is a discussion of you know playing Crown Reflection no matter what. Um, there's no Arcanite Skull Cap. Um, we are down to two unmovables. Uh, but you know we're, we're playing one Prismatic Shield. I know some players would opt to play two against uh, Bravo the Star of the Show. Uh, do you feel do you feel like this list is is very powerful to that current version that's off? Often, I think aggressive these days. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I would say that almost exclusively I'm playing against like a casino Starvo deck, mm -hmm. and uh, that I think this list is fantastic. Again, um, whenever there's a saying that when you go to the casino, you're you're pulling a slot lever at the end of the day, even if you feel like your odds are sixty percent or thirty five percent or whatever, you're still pulling a lever in that matchup, and there's not a lot of outskilling to be done. But um, I do like the Prismatic Shield a lot into it. If, if Starvo is something that you're really looking to, like, I need to beat this, then I would definitely play more. Uh, it, and uh, the big thing that you have to remember against Starvo is that what you're, ending, what you're trying to do is get as many auras into the battlefield while you're taking the first couple hits. That's generally the gameplay pattern. And so Crown helps you facilitate that. I've had a lot of hands where I get like quad blue and like three of them are auras or something like that. And I just happen to have a shield or I happen to have something in soul. 
And so the crown fixes that turn for you by still double ordering. And so if you can fix one of your hands, often that can lead to a win. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very much a, a proponent that you can play crown in every single matchup and you're not giving up more than like a percent or two. Um, I know that a lot of people like Arcanist Skull Cap because then you can Skull Cap plus unmovable and maybe a shield to like block out the Oak and Old or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a similar effect from um, Iron Hide or uh, I mean, just having a couple of shields out. So I don't see the big, like, I, I value much more getting the double aura into play over, you know, the potential to block with one less card. So that that's where I lie on that debate. And um, it's it's done really well for me so far outside of the Pro Tour. Um, the Pro Quests I played against, I think, two or three Starvos, and I pretty much trashed them all. So um, the deck is working as intended. It just it's when it's going to feel like you're either going to be losing by a lot or winning by a lot in most of those matchups. And uh, if the game is close, then it's probably yours for the taking too. Mm. And kind of my last sort of deck question here is: Have you ever have you considered and have you tried a library? Yeah, uh, um, I've tried library a lot. Um, it's highest variance card you could play. So if, if you like the feeling of trashing someone or getting trashed, uh, this is a card for you. Um, the Obviously, the point is if you can get it down early, then it's going to net you enough cards to win you the matchup. If you get it in like turn three or four, then it's probably even to something else that you could have played. And if you're getting it after that, uh, especially against like Starvo or something else that you actually want to play it against, um, it's probably going to lose you the game because either it's not netting you enough cards or it's a uh, block zero that doesn't do anything that you're trying to get rid of. So um, I I personally like to try to outskill my opponents with this deck. There's a lot of tricky things that you can do, and library isn't one of them. So. Um, and I found that it wasn't giving me enough percentage points across the board. It was more of like a 50-50 or worse type of proposition. So I'm I'm staying away from library for now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So heading into the pro quest, you know, maybe I'm taking it this weekend um, or in some of the following. Are there any tips that you would give me? And I'm going to give you two questions of that. Um, are there any cards that I should maybe consider swapping out? Or do you think this is the most up-to-date and kind of effective list to bring to tomorrow's metagame? Yeah, I wouldn't switch a card right now. I just updated this from my Pro Tour list. I took it to a Pro Quest this last weekend, and I, I won with it. And um, I think the reason that this list works so well is because the sideboarding is so tight and so good into everything. So really, it is at the, you know, it is at the player's uh, behest how well or how badly you do with it, because all the cards are there for you to go at least 50-50 or better into almost every matchup. Uh, very, very few exceptions. And even even I found Briar and Katsu, which are traditionally some of the worst matchups um, I have had major chances in. And so if if you value, um, as I said, out trying to outskill your opponents or having solid sideboard plans, all of my all of my sideboard plans are 60 cards, um, then this is this is the deck for you. And I I I would run this exactly as is for the upcoming pro quest. Awesome. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to mention that Tyler is actually going to write up an article for us to put up on Patreon if you want some extra content in addition to this. Um, so check that out. That should be up by the time this video is released or shortly after. We'll keep you updated. Deck list, as always, is in the description below. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know. This is definitely this is definitely an interesting deck, right? I, I think um, it's something I would definitely bring to a pro quest i know here in like randomly here in my meta <laughs> in uh in dallas nobody plays starvo and they just like never have <laughs> for some reason and then i'm planning to go up to oklahoma in a in a week or so and then you've got zach bun and the boys who only play earth briar so <laughs> I'm going to try to find a way to, to sneak this one in and, and play this list. I, I particularly want to play it against the Chains, um, and I know there's going to be a few Kanos as well. <laughs> Probably not me. Um, but yeah, looks interesting. I'm happy that you were able to take this archetype uh, to the Pro Tour and be successful, and I'm excited for you know what Uprising has to bring um, for the Illusionist class. But again, thank you so much, Tyler. Hope you all enjoyed the video, and um, we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.